Uh, Governor Deal has actually been fighting for a more fair and effective justice system throughout his career in public service. Uh, he's been a judge, he was a prosecutor. Uh, when I started my career uh, as a reporter in, in Atlanta, uh, I wrote a series of stories about two kids who were being held in juvenile detention, uh, not because they were dangerous, but because the county could not find a place for their parents. Uh, they could not find their parents and didn't have any other place to hold them. Uh, a state senator uh, at the time introduced legislation to prevent that uh, and make sure that there were emergency shelters in such cases. Uh, that was the 1980s, and that senator was Nathan Deal. Uh, so if you think conservatives have gotten behind criminal justice reform uh, purely for fiscal reasons, you're in for a real surprise this afternoon. Uh, Governor Deal likes save, saving taxpayer money, no doubt about that. Uh, and the Georgia reforms have saved taxpayers in Georgia hundreds of millions of dollars while keeping crime down. Uh, but he also has a deep moral commitment to building a system that is fundamentally fair, uh, and he understands that public safety and justice are not competing goals, but are mutually reinforcing goals. Uh, it's been our honor at Pew to support many of his efforts, uh, the efforts of a leader uh, who is not only a champion, but a tireless and lifelong champion of criminal justice reform, Governor Nathan Deal. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate the introduction. Thanks to all of you for being here today and for the program that you're participating in. I've looked at the speakers, and they are certainly very distinguished individuals and have a lot to offer in terms of this topic that we're all, I hope, interested in. You know, it's been said that uh, Andrew Carnegie once said that uh, if you want to be happy, set a goal that commands your thoughts, liberates your energy, and inspires your hopes. I think all of us, hopefully, at some point in our lives, try to seize on those words. I know when I became governor, in the 2010 election cycle and took office in January of 2011. There were many things that I had to learn and there were things that I knew and hoped to be able to do something about. In my first State of the State address in January of 2011, I made the issue of criminal justice reform one of the topics that I told our General Assembly I wanted them to consider. But with problems as large as those problems were for our state, and I think virtually the same is true for every other state, I decided you can't just jump into this unless you have very well-established support. Because the things I had in mind were going to take legislative changes. And with 180 members of our House and 56 members of our Senate, that, mean there had, that means there had to be a lot of convincing for those individuals to support the propositions that I was asking them to consider. So what I did was I appointed a Criminal Justice Reform Council. It was made up across party lines, across jurisdictional boundaries as it relates to the entire judicial system, and I charged them with coming back with recommendations that we could begin to implement that would make a difference. Now, in order to understand why I thought that was a topic that was worth our time and effort, I want you to consider these facts. In 2011, the state of Georgia was the 10th largest population state. On the bright side, I might add, we're now the eighth largest population state. But at the time we were the 10th largest population state, we had the fourth largest prison population in the country. We were disproportionate in terms to our population numbers. I was told, Governor, you need to be prepared in your budgets to build two new adult prisons in your first term. The estimated cost was some $264 million. And the reason I was told that was that the prison population of 56,000 
was projected to grow to about 60,000 as of last year, 2016. That year, we were spending about $19,000 per prison bed, and our total budget for our Department of Corrections was about $1.2 billion. Our recidivism rates for those who were being released from our adult prisons was about 30% of those who were released were coming back within a three-year period. On our juvenile side of the ledger, it was even worse. It was about 65% who had been released from our juvenile facilities were back in our facilities in three years or less, and many of them at that point in time had aged out so that they then went into our adult system when they came back. Those are not very encouraging numbers or propositions. So I wanted to do something about it in a positive way. When we appointed the commission, I asked them to start with a logical starting point, and that was, let's deal with a statistic that says that a vast number of our prison population are in prison for what we classified as nonviolent offenses. Now you tell the average citizen that you're spending $19,000 per inmate for offenses that you don't even consider to be violent, they would probably think there was something wrong with that on its face. Most of those that were in those categories were there because of addictions, drug, alcohol, or a combination of both. And of course, minor offenses that caused them to be, especially if they were repeat offenders of minor offenses, uh, property offenses, et cetera, they were winding up in prison beds. Now, we started from that proposition. And we have done this now over a period of about six years. Each legislative session since that first one, we have had major statutory proposals that have affected the criminal justice system. And each one of those has passed every year, and we will have another package this coming legislative session beginning in January of 2018, which will be my last legislative session since I am term limited, and this will be the end of my two terms. But let's talk about where we started. We started on those nonviolent adult offenders. We had a few of what we called accountability courts, a few drug courts, a few DUI courts, but there were not very many, and they were certainly not serving the population of our state as a whole. The conclusion from the report and study came back that we could do better if we would have more accountability courts to accommodate those who fit that definition, nonviolent, but nevertheless are in trouble with our law. So that effort, and I might say because of Adam's introduction to me to point out that in that study process, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust was a co-sponsor of that effort to undertake that study, and it was very, very helpful to us. Out of that came for the session in 2012, a proposal to create more adult accountability courts in order to divert adult nonviolent offenders. Now, when I first made this proposition to the General Assembly in my first State of the State address, some people came up to me and said, Governor, prison reform and criminal justice reform don't really sound like Republican agenda items. And I said, well, it doesn't matter. We need to do it. It's an issue that is costing our state money, and more importantly, it is costing our state the lives of many of our own citizens in the process. So that first legislative session in 2012, we took the recommendations of the commission to, uh, to increase substantially accountability courts in our state. And guess what? Even though 
It was thought at first that this was going to be a very difficult and divisive subject, one that might tend to break down along partisan lines. That session, that first legislation, passed unanimously in the House and the Senate. Now, I don't know what it's like in your state, but it's very difficult to pass anything unanimously in our General Assembly. But that did. And that was our first really big breakthrough. We have continued to expand on that aspect of criminal justice reform. We now have every one of our judicial circuits, with the exception of two, that have accountability courts in them. And I am told that by the end of this calendar year, all of our judicial circuits will have accountability courts. Now, to begin with, it was just the ones you would think of the most, drug courts, DUI courts. Now, we are seeing our communities become very creative. We have, uh, we have family courts. We have veterans courts. And increasingly, we are seeing mental health courts. So, it is having a tremendous positive effect on our state. Now, instead of having 60,000 people in our state prison system, instead of having to build two new adult prisons, our prison population has actually declined. From 56,000 that was supposed to go to 60,000 within a four-year time frame, it is now about 52,000, and we continue to see very positive results in that. And we didn't have to build those two new prisons. We, in fact, converted some of the ones that we already had into transition centers to make these accountability courts work even better. Well, that was only the beginning. The second year, we took on another very important part of our reforms, and that was juvenile justice reforms. Now, I'm sure there are some of you in the audience who work in this arena, and you will know that instead of $19,000 for an adult prison bed, it was costing us about $91,000 per bed for a year for a juvenile because you have to do so many other things and those things are expensive to have to do. And that high recidivism rate, as I told you, of about 65%. So we went with a model that said, let's create uh, diversion type programs, not courts as such, but simply community-based diversion programs. Now, I had been a juvenile court judge in my early years, and one of my greatest frustrations was when a, a young person was brought before my court, I had pretty much just two choices. I could either send that person back to where they came from, where they'd gotten in trouble, with a probation officer who was grossly overworked, or I could send them to one of our state institutions, which was as a general rule, not a very good solution either. So what we have done in the juvenile arena is to create these diversion programs at the community level, and they are working very, very well. We started with the counties that were sending us, in numbers, the largest number of juveniles into our system. And we have expanded it every year since then, and the numbers are staggeringly positive. And certainly, we're glad to see that. Now, <clears throat> we've gotten through the adult nonviolent. We've gotten through the juvenile nonviolent. What's next? I said, well, it's time we looked at that over 50,000 numbers of people that are in our state prison system and see what the results are going to be with them. I said, well, I want to know what the most common characteristic of those in our state prisons happens to be. And you might have guessed it. It came back that almost seven out of every 10 had dropped out of school, which meant they did not have a high school diploma, they did not have a GED, and many of them were in prison with long prison sentences. They went into prison, 
without a basic education and without any skills that would allow them to make a way in the world. So we have focused on that, and that is an ongoing effort, and it is one that I think is going to pay huge dividends in the future. How do you do that? Because what you're having to do is reach back in a person's life, someone who has now committed perhaps a major felony, and you're saying to them, you need to get a basic education. Well, we had GED programs in our prisons, not as large as perhaps they should have been, but they were there. Not a whole lot of emphasis, I think, was being placed on those. And I said, it's time we did something about it. So we did. We not only enhanced our GED programs, but we contracted, first of all, on a pilot basis and now on a permanent basis with a charter school system so that those who take advantage of our charter school within the prison can now actually get a high school diploma, not just a GED. And as you may know, in the minds of many employers, that is an important distinction. But even that was not enough because having a high school diploma or a GED and a felony on your record, you still are going to have a very difficult time finding a job. So I said, let's give them some skills that they can take to an employer so they can get a job and be able to keep a job and support themselves and support their families. And that's what we're doing. We have partnered with our technical college system and they send teachers into our prisons and they're teaching them a variety of skills. I'm sure that in your states, you have the same kind of skill gaps that we have in Georgia. We are, as I indicated earlier, a very fast growing state. And by the way, we've just been named for four consecutive years as the best state in the nation in which to do business. So if you wanna move somewhere, Georgia might be a good place for you to come. We have created over 700,000 private sector jobs in the last six and a half years in our state. And uh, our state continues to be the home of Fortune 500 company headquarters and it continues to be a place that people like to come. But you're not going to be able to get a job, even in a state like ours that has thousands of new jobs, if you don't have the right skill set. So we're teaching them in our prison system in cooperation with our technical college system, and we can almost guarantee them that if they will follow through with these educational programs, they will be able to get a job when they get out. I have to brag on one of our Georgia companies, Blue Bus Bird Company, uh, Blue Bird Bus Company, get it right here in a minute. They are one of the largest, if not the largest, maker of school buses in the United States. And in making that kind of a product, they need skilled welders. They told me early on, if you will send us someone who is a competent and qualified welder, we will hire that person. And true to their word, they have done that. And quite frankly, good welders make very good salaries. So we're having real success, but we have to continue to ask the employer community to open their hearts, to open their minds, and to be willing to give someone who has had a felony, who's made a bad mistake in their past, the opportunity to have a new life. We can do everything we can to educate them and we're doing a lot in that regard. But we still need the employer community to be willing to give them a chance. Well, that's not easy to do. Uh, they're always afraid that they're gonna be sued if they hire someone who's had a felony record. If something goes wrong at work, uh, some innovative trial lawyer and I used to be an innovative trial lawyer, uh, is going to sue them for that very reason. So what we have done is that we will give these individuals a certificate specifying what their skill set is, specifying that they have passed the exams and have a stamp of approval from the state of Georgia that they can take to a prospective employer. And with that, that employer is given at least limited liability protection against wrongful employment suits. 
I think it will make a difference, and it's beginning to show that it is making a difference. So we're continuing to work on that. This year, as we come to the next session of the General Assembly, we will have another package of criminal justice reforms. They will sometimes be simply tweet, uh, tweaks of reforms we already have in place as we go back and try to close some gaps in the arena of reform and reentry. And reentry continues to be one of our focal points, as it should be. And there are two big impediments to successful reentry. One is a place to live. And that is difficult for many of these inmates to find a place to live. Because if they've served a long sentence, they probably have alienated their family or lost contact with their family, or the family just simply doesn't want them to come back, which presents a real problem for them. Now, in that regard, I have suggested to my congressional members from Georgia, and perhaps you might, if you think it's a worthwhile notion, you might encourage your members in Congress to do the same, and that is most housing authorities that receive federal grants to operate their authority prohibit people who have a felony record from being allowed to rent one of their units. Now, I know why they do that, but that is the old mindset. We need housing for these returning citizens. And I believe that your taxpayer money that is going by the tens of hundreds of millions of dollars to support housing in your local communities, there should be some allocation somewhere that will provide affordable housing for returning citizens, especially those who have done what they can do to improve themselves, to get an education, and to acquire a marketable skill. But that is one of the big impediments, is housing. The second big impediment is employment. And that is equally difficult. I mentioned to you the certificate we're giving them if they've completed our classes and have acquired skills that they can take to an employer. But I went a little further. I know you're all familiar with the term ban the box. Well, what that is, if you're not familiar with it, is when you fill out an application for a job and got all these questions, check the box, you know, this, that, and the other. One of those questions invariably is, do you have a felony on your record? Well, if they are a returning citizen who does have a felony on their record and they're truthful, they're going to have to check that box. And the reality is that most human resources managers when they are looking at those applications and they see that box has been checked, it gets no further than their desk. And there's no job forthcoming from that point forward. So instead of trying to legislatively force employers to do something and usually force to get people to do the right thing is not the most effective way, I said let's set the example. So. For state employment, we have banned the box. And if someone is applying, if, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> if someone has looked on the state website for available state jobs and they file an application and they have to check that box, we give them the assurance that they will have a face-to-face -face interview with someone representing the state agency that they're applying for a job with who will talk to them and give them a chance to explain why they should be hired. That's only fair. That is the kind of thing that I think will allow people within our system to have an incentive to work even harder, to acquire skill, to know that somebody is going to listen to their story. Now, their story is going to be sorted in its beginning. That's the reason they wound up in prison. And just as you earn your way into prison by bad conduct, I'm one of those that believes you ought to be able to at least partially earn your way out of prison by good conduct. And if they have had good conduct, if they've taken advantage of what was offered to them by way of increased education, acquisition of skills, 
they deserve to be able to tell their story. So we are setting the example at the state level. We hope, and we have seen actually, local governments who are doing the same thing with people applying for local government jobs. And I am proud that they're doing so. At some point, I am hopeful that the broader uh, community of employers in our state will begin to follow that same example. We have a few that have, and the more I have the opportunity to encourage employer groups to do so, the more of them say, well, that's a fair proposition, and we're going to follow that example as well. So those are the main areas that we have uh, taken on. They are big areas, but the truth of the matter is we are saving money. When you start saving $19,000, and now it's probably twenty dollars to $21,000 for every prison bed you don't need, you start saving that money, then you begin to accumulate resources you can use for other purposes. We have plowed those savings back into our accountability courts so that people are given a second chance if they'll take advantage of it. Now, they are called accountability courts for a reason, because they are a court that holds a person accountable for their conduct and tries to guide them through the process so that they can actually graduate from one of those courts. It's usually in our state a two-year process, and it's intensive. And if you foul up, it's up to the judge as to whether or not you go right back to prison or whether you are sent back to the local county jail to stay for a couple of days or a week until you decide that maybe, yes, I can get on with this program and complete it successfully. But it is one of the greatest things that we have seen. I tell the story about my wife and I when we go out shopping. Mainly it's me going with my wife as she shops. And I noticed that from time to time, we'd have people who would come up and say things to me because our son is a superior court judge, which in our state is a major trial court, and he is also a judge of a drug court. They would come up to me and they would say to both of us, um, I love your son, I was in his, in his drug court, or I'm in his drug court, or I graduated from his drug court. You know, and, and I was sort of being the cautious individual I think I am, I'd start looking around to see who is overhearing this conversation because I thought they would be embarrassed to tell me they were in or had graduated from a drug court. And it finally dawned on me they weren't ashamed of it. They were proud of it because they had taken advantage of an opportunity and they were making the most of it. And for the first time in many of their lives, they were being rewarded for doing something right instead of simply being punished for doing something wrong. That's not only rehabilitation. That is religious in nature. It is redemption. That's what we should all want. We should want to change the lives of those who made bad mistakes and give them a chance to show that they can live a life as a law-abiding citizen. So for those of you in this audience who are engaged in this work, I want to thank you. You're making a difference, I'm sure, in your local community and in your states. And I know that our people in the state of Georgia who are working in these programs they are making a difference, not only in the lives of the individuals that they touch, but in the families of those individuals as well. As I say to my preacher friends, if you ever run out of sermon material, visit a drug court graduation. My son used to invite me to come speak to him. I'm too tenderhearted. I can't take it. You hear stories of mothers who've lost custody of their children, of people who, men whose families had totally given up on them and they weren't welcome to be seen at any family function, all of a sudden saying, I've gotten my children back. 
I've got a good job. I'm supporting my children instead of being a drain on the taxpayers of this state. Those are the kinds of heartwarming stories that I never get enough of. And I don't think you will either. So thank you for what you're doing. And I thank those sponsoring organizations who sponsored this program here today. And I thank the John Jay University for making this possible. And Carol, thank you so very much for being our host today. I thank you for caring. And that's really what you have to have. You have to have a caring heart. Too often government lacks one thing, and that is a caring heart. So I encourage all of you, focus on that in your own life and in your own dealings with people, and you will be rewarded richly. Thank you for having me with you here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Craig DeRoche, Rashad Robinson, Brittany Packnett, and Vanita Gupta. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here today with my friends. I feel like there's friends in the audience and friends here on stage. Uh, Brittany Patnick from Build Love Empower, Rashad Robinson from Color of Change, and Craig DeRoche from Prison Fellowship, and me, Vanita Gupta from the Leadership Conference. I am, we are here uh, sitting this afternoon with some really, some of the most creative thinkers and advocates who are um, breaking the mold and have been for years trying to do everything they can to be more innovative to make change happen in this world on criminal justice reform. And so I just want to, we're going to talk today about uh, criminal justice reform and advocacy strategies and tactics in the 21st century. Uh, and I want to start by asking a rather open-ended question, and Brittany, I'll start with you. If you could just talk about an advocacy campaign or strategy that you've employed that affects criminal justice policy at the state and local level that you think has kind of broken the mold a little bit against the backdrop of some of the real challenges we're facing at the federal level. So uh, thanks so much for the question and thanks for having me here in this important gathering. So I um, co-founded a platform called Campaign Zero, which I actually talked about on this stage like maybe a year ago. Um, and our belief is that we can live in a world where the police don't kill people. So we are a ten. We have a ten-point policy platform uh, focused on ending police violence, everything from taking on police unions to um, dealing with training and implicit bias and lots of things in between. A lot of folks in the activist community would have stopped there, but we took a cue, honestly, from the academics that we consulted during um, the, the creation process, and we started to create reports. Uh, we tried to make the reports really sexy and user-friendly, so uh, the, the kind of infographic style, um, but we did a report on use of force, and what we found were that there are eight use of force policies that do not require any kind of legislation for a police department to take on uh, that dramatically reduce uh, in police violence in every instance. What we also found was that there was no police department of the 100 largest in the country that was doing all eight. And so what we did from there was take those eight, actually create those policies, right? Write them up in the form of policies and start working with local activists so that they could get mayors or whomever was in charge of creating those regulations uh, to, to move those things. So it was literally plug and play in a way that said, this has real backing in research. It's supported by members of the community. It's supported by academia. Uh, and you don't have to do any heavy lifting. We've done all of the heavy lifting for you. And here's a user-friendly way that you can explain it to your constituents and your officers alike. So we've so far seen Baton Rouge and 
in Sacramento take those uh, use of force policies in total and start to implement them in their police departments, which has been, um, I think, important for us because a lot of people see us out on the streets as activists. I was a Ferguson protester and have protested all around this country, but we recognize that as mounting the kind of pressure that makes people pay attention to the kind of research and reporting that we're doing such that we can help pass those those regulations. Yeah, thank you. Rashad, maybe, but yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, at Color of Change, we fundamentally believe that um, we have to build power to change the rules. And, um, and power, we really think about as changing not just the written rules, but the unwritten rules, the written rules of policy, the written rules of policy and the unwritten rules of culture. And so, you know, for the last several years, Color of Change, like many organizations, like my friend Brittany and others, have shown up um, in communities where people were harmed and hurt by law enforcement and nothing was done, have shown up when issues of mass incarceration became present and tried to translate people's energy into action. And most of the time, what we saw was that the incentive structures just weren't there. That no matter how loud folks were, no matter how visible folks were, we actually didn't have the right level of power, the right level of strategic insight to move change. And so we made two really key um, sort of steps. One was really focusing on district attorneys. Um, and over the last several years, um, Brittany and I have been in a number of meetings at the White House during the last administration. Um, Be clear meeting, about that. Meeting with uh, uh, President Obama and other staff, um, pushing reforms. But what I consistently kept thinking was, wow, local district attorneys are more powerful than the folks around these tables on many of the issues. Uh, 2,400 district attorneys in this country, up to 80% of them run unopposed uh, and are making decisions every single day without having um, to answer to the communities that they serve. And so what we decided to do was that as much as we have a list of policy demands, as much as we were having people pushing um, and making demands that unless we engaged in the electoral conversation around district attorneys, that nothing was gonna change. And so we had to engage by launching our PAC to move into district attorney races around the country and to move the energy of the thousands of people who had been showing up with us into actually doing voter contact in this last election cycle. And voter contact in places like Chicago and Orlando and Philadelphia um, and working to translate that energy into actual turnout working to force folks who are running for office to actually have to listen to our community. And the other strategic insight we really um, focused on, and I'm hoping that we can sort of talk more about this in depth as we get into questions, was on bail reform. And thinking about the ways in which money bail in this country um, creates an incentive structure that forces people into pleas, that makes it m better off if you are um, guilty and rich than innocent and poor, and we started looking as an organization that focuses not just on government power, but on corporate power, on the role of big insurance in the bail industry. And we, um, along with the ACLU, produced a report that looked at the role of insurance companies in backing the bail bonds industry, the $2 billion plus um, uh, industry that's been created by local and by, by national insurance companies, many of whom keep their money offshore, and then starting to run strategic campaigns around the country in local places, highlighting their role in lobbying to keep bail in place. And so in many ways, it's not just mobilizing people power, but it's directing that people power in the most strategic ways, asking people in these moments that they want to take action, what is the most strategic way we can make their voices heard? And just before I get to Craig for one second, what's interesting, I'm going to pull back to the DA races, is in some ways that avenue has, I mean, could have been something that had been tapped for a long time. Why do you think it's, this was the moment where people are really focused on local DA races? And Craig, I'll get right to you next. So it's a couple of things. I think that there was the sort of promise of what was possible at the federal level. Um, the Obama administration got there um, and uh, people started to think, wow, we are gonna like have all these changes with the criminal justice system and everything is gonna be made, made whole. And we started to see um, the limitations. I mean, I had many conversations with you about the limitations about what DOJ could do. And so being sort of stopped at the door with people who um, would say they're on your side and are on your side, but could do 
couldn't do the things that you wanted them to do. And then at the same time, we had people mobilized. And to continue to ask them to do the same thing over and over again and hope for different results was gonna be crazy. And so we started to look for where are the ways in which we can actually engage. And so much of the criminal justice work for so long has been sort of 501c3 educational opportunity, oftentimes not engaging in sort of political power. And what we realized was unless we were contending and electoralizing this, um, outrage and engagement and energy, unless we were translating that into actual outcomes, nothing would happen. And so yes, it could have, folks could have been doing district attorney races at this level 10, 15 years ago. The fact that we've got people now focused on it, the fact that we've got a thousand district attorneys that will be up for election this coming um, 2018, the fact that um, we will be able to contend in many important races around the country, not all thousand, um, and start raising the floor on what's acceptable and start pushing up the ceiling on what's possible in terms of what the most powerful actors in terms of safety and justice get to do every single day. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, a little bit on the big picture and a little bit on the specific practical, um, you know, seeing it demonstrated in, in an example of 21st century advocacy. Because in many ways there are changes, but, but uh, uh, some of the best things stay the same. Uh, by way of background, prison fellowship, we are in uh, over a thousand prisons with our Angel Tree program. We're in uh, 28 states with 77 of our academies, 190,000 volunteers, very substantial, 175,000 donors, very substantial imprint of providing services, prisoners and their families, using that experience to try to inform our advocacy. We are founded by a person who is the architect of the 1972 presidential campaign, which was a landslide for Richard Nixon, and he wrote in his book, for those of you in history, look up the, the book Life Sentence, pages 12 and 13, where he describes the White House conversation about developing the narrative of tough on crime after the Attica riots. Longer sentences, tough on crime, the war on drugs. He actually had a very heavy hand in, in creating that template. By the time I met him in 2011, I was a former Speaker of the House in Michigan, I had helped Mitt Romney create his campaign in 2005. I had been arrested twice for my own addictions, destroyed my entire life, left nothing much standing, had it admitted to my own addictions and was speaking on addiction policy and reform from a conservative standpoint. And Chuck said that he thought that my experience could be used to benefit other people. And he was speaking specifically to the 21st century advocacy as he saw things changing and he saw the good of what organizations like Prison Fellowship and many in this room have done, which is you have to return the debate to being about human life in the potential of redemption of each person, including himself, who was not a very popular guy. He was the Steve Bannon of his time with Richard Nixon. But by the time he passed away 40 years later, people realized the miraculous <coughs> change that occurred in him through his own redemption and, and recovery. And for folks like me and so many other of the speakers in the room, that's where I'd like to return this to and, and to say that um, there's a lot of tactics and strategy I think that we'll get to in the process of answering these questions. Um, but there, there was something missing in the national dialogue that needed to be inserted again. And that I am very excited because I think it's, it's front and center right now is that we're answering the so what, who's this about? It's not about other people, it's about ourselves. It's about what we think of ourselves, it's about what we think of our own value, the value of our kids, our spouses, our neighbors. That's what's at stake here. Because if it's just about money, you know, if it's just about spreadsheets and budgets and, and the other things, you'll lose every day. I know that from my time as being the Speaker of the House and a Minority Leader. I served a couple of years in both positions of where you spend your time, where you spend your interests. And to give you a specific example, as we open up the door, and we, you know, we're going to present on a number of topics here, but um, the beginning of my work, Chuck told me to do this in 2011 in the fall. He passed away in 2012, right at the time uh, that I was working in Georgia with Governor Deal. And uh, there was a, uh, the package of bills that he referred to was ready to go. And before that unanimous vote that he talked about, I was called off a plane. I was on my way to Tallahassee and I had a layover in Atlanta. And I got a panicked call saying that the Democratic caucus were gonna vote no, that they were gonna use this vote as leverage 
uh, um, to get some other bills passed and that, and, and, uh, that they were going to say it was soft on crime and, and uh, the uh, workers in the correctional um, unions were going to back them. And um, I got off the plane, I drove over to Atlanta, and I, and I talked about the morals and the values that were at stake with the Republican caucus that was in the majority, but I also called my friends at the NAACP. And when they called over to the Democratic leader, they phrased it this way. So our understanding is when we go picket you guys next week, that you want to lock up young African-American men to create jobs. That's what the Democrats stand for in Georgia. I'm tipping my hat to the NAACP, by the way, in saying that they took a strong stand on the morality of what was being proposed in the political expediency of the narrative of the day. And so as we unpack these things, I want you to know that the people on the right, you know, the people on the left that have been the most successful 21st century advocacy in general at a big scale and with the specifics as we explore them and give examples are the people that put their values on the line and, and talk about them strongly. And, and that's the practical example of within an hour, the situation was clarified and, and miraculously, uh, both parties that wanted to walk away from a deal voted unanimously to pass significant reforms. Rashad, oh no, let me see, hold on. Okay, Rashad, do you wanna yeah, speak so, to that? So thank you for that story because I think um, it's also a story of power. Um, it's a story of, um, communities most impacted, like the NAACP, having power. And I think that sometimes we um, focus on having presence without power, visibility or awareness without power. Um, we work to build empathy, um, and that gets people to see a situation that's unfortunate um, instead of power when they see a situation as unjust. And so what I think the story is great because it showed that um, there were all sorts of forces at play on power, regardless of sort of like political affiliation. And that um, there are so many um, entities that are willing to profit um, off of uh, the legacy of slavery, which is mass incarceration in this country. And um, not just profit from, you know, from, a, from money, but profit from power, opportunity, um, job growth, whatever. Um, and to the extent that we have to build the type of powerful campaigns in our community, if we think about 21st century power, I do think that we wanna be careful not to be in the thing that sometimes we often get to, and I'll talk about just the left, because the left does magical thinking a lot, where we think that if we like develop an app uh, we can code our way out of it, or um, we go into the courtroom with one legal with one legal case, and we solve all the problems. Or that we have one research report. Um, we do research reports. Other people do research reports, but one research report. We just get the facts out there, and then people will like suddenly come to our conclusion, right? Just like a, you know, or that we create a nonprofit and we nonprofit executive direct our way out of the problems. And without people power and narrative change, nothing will change. Because we are in a conversation in this country about power. A school, and this is not just on criminal justice, a school of beautiful white children can get shot up with guns, we can have the public polling say we want gun reform, and nothing happens. Because these are conversations about building power. So in the 21st century, when we think about the role of whether it be technology or culture, at the heart of it, it has to be about finding the strategic interventions to build power and force institutions and decision makers to be accountable. Force people to be nervous about disappointing the most impacted communities. Because without that, all the other things will fail and fall. It doesn't mean that we don't need empathy. It means that when you have empathy, big corporations going feel bad for kids in poor failing schools and they go and do service days at those schools instead of cleaning them up. If we have just empathy, people will just focus on reentry programs instead of actually dealing with why people are inside in the first place in the laws and structures. I'll stop there. So let me give applause, applause. So I want to push that a little bit further, Brittany. And, um, you know, there's a thing that is transactional power too, which can be its own problem, or you build 
power for the moment where there might be a particular outrage or injustice. And particularly with social media and technology where so much of the organizing is happening online, like where is the movement building or sustaining work that's done? And I wanna pick that up on like, in the conservative movement for criminal justice reform, you know, I, I would love, Craig, then for you to pick that up and talk about like what are the values that are sustaining momentum even in the face of, I think, tremendous pressures from probably within the Republican Party or in the White House or whatever else to talk a little bit about what I think it's powerful to think about whether values actually help sustain the power in these movements. So, Brittany, let me ask you first. Well, in it, Rashad's point really made me think about the fact that if we're honest, especially in marginalized communities, power is a dirty word, right? It is a dirty concept. It is the thing that the people who have been oppressing you have, and therefore it can't be any good. It can't be leveraged for good. Instead of recognizing that actually power is something that we should stop ceding to those folks, right? And reclaim it for ourselves. That is why it was so important for us. Um, that's why it was so important for us after we wrote the use of force report to return to activists and say, so now that you have exercised your power on the streets, now that you have created what Dr. King called that tension, right, created the crisis so that power structures are forced to move, now that you have exercised that power in a way that helps you recognize that you even have it, we want you to continue to practice what it means to use that power, right? And so we are not, we, we created what we call a platform instead of an organization, right? Because we weren't actually about creating something that sustained ourselves. We were about creating something that sustained the people, right? So we wanted to create tools that people could leverage in their power and that could actively give them the opportunity to practice that power because unless you practice the power, you're going to keep ceding it to other folks. You're going to keep thinking it's a dirty thing. You're going to keep thinking that you don't want to be powerful. Um, and so for me, that is how we get beyond this kind of episodic thing, right? And especially in, and you know, I do racial justice work broadly, but especially in this conversation about police violence, the episode always happens when somebody else dies, right? And it, and it depends on if that thing gets enough attention, if the right reporter writes about it, if the right person tweets about it, if it happened in the right city with the right amount of activists or activists who are used to working on this. And it, de it depends on the perfection of the victim, right? So there are so many um, conditions placed on on our efficacy when we allow it to be episodic in that way. Um, and that is why we have tried to continue not only to broaden what people are focused on, but how people are using that continued energy. And so you can actually see a lot of this progress in St. Louis, for example. So say in St. Louis, we had not just one killing with Michael Brown, but we had actually six killings by police in a six month span of time, all across St. Louis city and county. So the protest movement continued to grow because we were literally collecting people from different neighborhoods because it hit their neighborhood now. And so instead of letting this be the Shaw neighborhood episode or the Ferguson episode or the Berkeley neighborhood episode, all of the folks from Ferguson came to Shaw. And then we got more people in Shaw and all of the folks from Ferguson and Shaw were in Berkeley. And so we continued to grow and then swung that into electoral campaigns. So if you remember, the Ferguson City Council was all white. It is no longer all white. And that's because Shaw activists and Berkeley activists and Ferguson activists showed up, knocked on doors, did all of, made the phone calls, did the voter contact, did all of those kinds of things to run a slate of candidates. We've got two activists from, those, from that community, one who's now in the state house, one who's now an assembly member. Um, we've, we've gotten a new, a new circuit attorney. Uh, we were very, very close to having it. We were 888 votes shy of having our most progressive mayor in history. Um, but we kept giving people different tasks, right? That allowed them to say this thing that I practiced last week, this power that I started to get used to last week, I can now use it for something else. And this thing keeps on building, right? It was just like when I was teaching child, you understand addition and then you can do sub uh, subtraction. When you understand addition and subtraction, then you can do multiplication. When you can do division, when you can do multiplication, multiplication, you can do division. It builds confidence, it builds understanding, and that practice is the, the through line that we keep trying to bring through. A, so that power is no longer a dirty word, but B, such that people build confidence by exercising their power and getting real wins.
Um, so, Craig, let me. I'm going to rephrase this, and it's building off of what Rashad and Brittany have said. But it kind of, in, in a certain sense, obviously, the political climate is different today than it was a year ago. And you were talking about values, and presumably, one of the kind of benefits of movements being animated by values is because is that they should sustain political wins. And so, I want if you could just speak to a little bit the moment that we find ourselves in. You, as a conservative criminal justice reformer. You know, reflect a little bit about kind of where the values piece comes in, and for state, for folks working on state and local reform, and doing right-left reform work, how has the political climate changed or not changed, and how has it affected your current-day advocacy? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, first, I'll start with a little uh, Chuck Colsonism here. That yeah, the culture is the cult, right? And and um, so to influence the representatives of that culture. Um, you have to influence the cult, the, the people, and, and um, have them speak out. So I appreciate, you know, the, the, all the contributions that, um, for the politicians, what I try to remind people is, um, we are not trying to persuade people to adopt a new set of values. I don't see that from the American left or the American right. What we're trying to do is to get people to live up to the ideas that they campaigned on or that they say that they ascribe to which happen to be very different from what the public policy is in America related to justice. So if I could, I'm, I'm going to give, and, and I hope I don't offend anybody in this room, my family's been visited by tragedy. I'm not going to explain it here. I'm not trying to be insensitive. But I want to draw an important example. When you go to uh, talk to people about the values that they already have, it helps to listen to where those are and where we find agreement. So when I'm talking with my friends on the left, what I've noticed is we share a very similar passion for the value of human life when people are already born, when they're alive, when they're facing struggle, when they're in their foster care system, when they're in the criminal justice system. We fight just as hard with the same principles and the values. So I don't have to fight with them about abortion or end of life issues. I recognize where our values are aligned and, and I can speak into those values. When you're speaking with a conservative, and this, again, not meaning to be insensitive, but, but very relevant, is when you're talking to conservatives that today, as we speak, with the tragedy in Las Vegas, where they say that the Second Amendment would be a difficult thing to give up because of what their concern of an overbearing government having the guns and not the citizenry. They're talking about their values, whether you agree or not. And if you listen to that, you'd recognize a pathway to reminding them that they should be fighting just as hard for the Eighth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment and, and everything else that's in that Bill of Rights. If that's what their values already are, then they should be a warrior and a soldier alongside us with bail reform and with making sure it's not just a warm body doing the council, but that is an overbearing government that has three or four well-paid lawyers and DNA experts prosecuting somebody, and that same check and balance should apply to your philosophy, sir, that I should have three or four people and, and a DNA expert then, if you actually believe in what you've said your values are. And we can have an entirely different construction of the debate, and, and, and we can engage and, and, and come alive with that, because most people don't want to flip-flop. They don't want to go back and forth. They don't want to equivocate. But we haven't articulated it well in this country that, that what we come from, out of what we say our core beliefs are and what we put on our campaign literature, and again, guilty of this and not always living up to it, is that you can be held to account for that. And that's what this movement needs to choose our words and our fights to do. If we truly want to go further, it's great to pass an indigent defense bill that affords a million more dollars in New York or something like that, but it's better for us to define the values and say that we're not going to be happy until the defense is competitive with the prosecution in every way. Because that's what we actually believe in our heart is the right way to run the American justice system. So I just wanted to draw. Is that hopefully I made yeah. a point there? No, you did. And I want to just push you, though, to answer the last part of my question, which is in this political climate where there are different values and the, out of the conservative movement on criminal justice reform, I would say, I think, you know, Jeff Sessions may be um, uh, let in the minority compared to the majority on criminal justice reform, but how has it had an impact on state and local work from the right on criminal justice reform or not? Absolutely it has, and what a remarkable change that Vanita can make that statement. Take that in. She just said that Jeff Sessions' opinion on criminal justice is in the minority in Republicans, which 
Imagine saying that 10 years ago. I would say at the federal level, yeah. he was to the right of his party as senator, right? So, but, but still, yeah, no, I mean, I, mean, it was, I, I think he, that's he, right. It was a far more popular position 10 years ago is what I'm saying. It, it, it's uh, going away, um, uh, uh, certainly. And uh, what the attorney general is doing um, is he's representing uh, um, an ideology or, or a practice, a political practice is a better way to say it because it's not an ideology. Um, that I think that was a was a shortcut was never consistent with uh, conservatism uh, was never consistent with the Bill of Rights was a, a political winner for a time in America and um, it's it's uh, it, it's it's fading away but absolutely the idea that um, returning to it uh, still has its supporters and and um, the Attorney General's uh, speaking to that and with some of the policy changes has um, uh, uh, fueled uh, um, some additional resistance, but we're seeing even in the White House with the Center for American Innovation, led by Jared Kushner, a different path being uh, set um, literally as we speak. So uh, I think even um, at, at the White House, it's not going uncontested. Well, it, look, my, my belief on criminal justice is that it was, the buildup has been over 40 years on the hands of Democrats and Republicans, and we've had mass incarceration buildup. Uh, by both parties who um, are responsible for this. So, but let me let me turn it back to Rashad now. You know, one of the things that I think Color of Change has been so enormously effective at is this incredible like digital organizing, getting people to get invested, recognizing secondary enablers, as you said, with the corporate sector, the folks who actually may not be the primary targets, but people who are, are surrounding and enabling a certain, or profiting literally out of a set of practices. Um, and But I wanna ask, like in this, well, Rashad, like, what do you think about whether that form of organizing can actually supplant on the brutes, door to door, knocking, You've been increasingly doing electoral work and like looking at DA's races. You were deeply invested in the DA's race in Philadelphia. I mean, it's not an either or, but how do you kind of work the two strategies in tandem as color as the head of color of change? Yeah, it's it's just it's not an either or. It's um, you know, we have this model of respond build, pivot, and scale. Respond to moments that are happening so that you are capturing people's energy in that moment because otherwise people will go back to doing what they were doing before. Try to build energy and engagement and allies and, and power through um, organizing people and then pivot to the systemic issue. And so um, if the systemic issue is corporate power, if the systemic issue is trying to change a law or get someone out of office, and then trying to scale that participation over time, so you're keeping people deeply engaged over a period of time. What I will say is that um, in all of this work, um, moving people from online to offline engagement is critically important and not thinking of them as, as sort of deeply separate things. Technology, um, we sometimes get, um, we sometimes fantasize about how, what technology is going to solve, but technology has always been used in civil rights struggles. Julian Bond once told me, the late Julian Bond once told me the story of when SNCC installed the Watts line in their Shore University office, which was the precursor to the 1-800 number, and allowed them to bypass the Ma Bell operators that would largely inter intercept their calls in the South um, that were controlled by the White Citizens Council. Um, the Watts line did not uh, change their theory of change or their organizing principles. It was a technology that allowed them to move information quicker. It allowed them to um, um, be smarter about how they moved it, but it did not, if they had a bad organizing strategy, Watts Line wouldn't have helped them, nor would any texting platform help us, any Facebook page or Twitter account. What I'll also say just quickly to sort of respond to what you were saying, um, sort of about sort of people's values. I think people say a lot of things and then act completely different. How many times do people say that they uh, would choose the vegetables, but then when given a choice, pick the french fries? Um, I'm one of those people, so. Um, people say things all the time, and so we actually have to get down to people's actual behavior. This goes to the political leaders, down to the voters. And to the extent that the reasons why people may 
show up for the Second Amendment and what they say of why they show up for the Second Amendment and why they may not show up for sort of other um, rights and protections that are part of the Constitution are not simply just about sort of what they may say, but it's about um, things that are deeper that we actually have to get to. And until we actually fundamentally change the power structure around race in this country, then we can't, then the, all the other trickery is just not going to work. And until we deal with the fact that people see inequality, whether it be poverty, racism, sexism, as unfortunate, like a car accident, that's really sad, that's sad that happened to that person, instead of unjust, where we actually have to change it. Until we move people from unfortunate to unjust, we will continue to have solutions that don't change structures. We will continue to have solutions that actually don't get us to real change. And we'll do a lot of, we may make ourselves feel better, we may make some cuts at the corners, but we actually won't get to the core structural problem. And so the technology, the cultural work, those are all sort of the tools that we use to build the house. That's not the fundamental organizing strategy and what we are trying to actually do to move people in collective power towards real action and change. And, and yes. And here's why that is so such a significant point, because the one thing we have not talked about yet, which we have to talk about, is money. Yeah. Jeff Sessions doesn't need the majority of the people to be on his side. He just needs the right people to be on his side, right? Well, the right, go ahead. No, and let me just say, I mean, it's not just that, because he can, he's, got, he's the Attorney General of the United States who controls a lot of the purse strings that are going to all the state yes. and local jurisdictions. It's yes. policy, it's federal enforcement, but it's a much bigger proposition than that. It is a much bigger proposition than that, right? So if you trace, if you connect the dots of the, the criminal justice system in Missouri alone and you figure out who's profiting from that, it's not some, it, it's not Rush Limbaugh, right? It's not some wild tiki torch bearing far right white supremacist. It's a car rental company. That's who's interested in, in propelling this, right? That's who's interested in keeping this up. Jeff Sessions, this system doesn't need the right, it doesn't need all the people, it needs the right people, right? The right people who control enough of the purse strings, who can, who can pick up the phone and call the governor, who can pick up the phone and call the president, who can pick up the phone and do and move any pieces that they need to do and block and tackle any of the things that we've been trying to push forward. It's those people that I worry about, right? Who tend to be I wouldn't even say a vocal minority, right, but a powerful minority. So when we're talking about wrestling that power away, A, we have to actually expose that, and B, to Rashad's point, we have to deal with this systemic fact that no matter how much black people pull their money, no matter how much brown people pull their money, we still don't have that kind of wealth. Right, we get, Grandma Gladys gave her a couple of dollars to President Obama, and she could do that one time. We can't do this repeatedly, right? And so we have to, to, to your point, this has to be a structural shift such that power sits in a different place in the ways that supposedly our founding documents intended. So let me um, open up. We only have about 14 minutes left and I'm happy to have folks ask some questions. Let me, I'll give it a minute while I ask uh, another one, which is, on the values question, there are, I mean, Rashad, I know Color of Change has been doing work and maybe you can speak about it a little bit on the Hollywood front. And I would be interested though, Craig, for you to start us off just quickly about where are the, the venues you've been, you've done a lot of faith-based organizing, you've been an elect, state elected official. Where are the fora where the values, where you think that you are bringing people with you on the values front? And so I would just like to talk a little bit about hearts and minds here want to get us started? Um, yeah, you know, the, it's cool. I actually get to talk about Hollywood for a change at Prison Fellowship. That may sound like an oxymoron, but our CEO is James Ackerman, a former CEO of uh, Documentary Channel and other Hollywood uh, media companies. He's the son of Princess from Father Knows Best, it, uh, for those of you of a certain age that would know that show. And uh, he's from the Hollywood Hills, and he's now our CEO. So we're uh, uh, more actively involved, and I think it's very important that we speak into this. And so um, I was happy to contribute to the 13th and a number of other um, 
uh, movies that we're doing because we do need to uh, engage the culture in that way. And um, just so you know that we're doing our bread and butter work too at Prison Fellowship and other organizations, uh, you'll see us, we wrote a curriculum um, in churches, there's a tradition a lot of these mega churches that you're hearing people are going to that they do small groups and it's usually a six or eight week study on everything from marriage to finance uh, we can't print fast enough small group study guides on justice reform and those are going to predominantly white evangelical churches and predominantly african-american urban churches and um, we're trying to do our part there and you'll see other um, organizations that are conservatives like the american enterprise institute uh, uh, the Koch family of <laughs> invested in advocacy organizations all uh, trying to speak into the culture through the channels that they uh, either can contribute to or, or that they own through distribution to their own people, uh, the Tea Party, the tax reform movement, and others. So it's really catching on. Rashad. Yeah, I mean, the Hollywood work for us is just an extension of trying to deal with the sectors of power. When I hear stories from our members, you know, our members are touched by the criminal justice system in all sorts of ways, formerly incarcerated folks, people who are family members and love folks who are returning citizens, um, people who, who are living communities um, where they're consistently touched by the inequities. And so what we've really tried to look at is what can we do about the ways in which the culture, the, the culture of Hollywood sort of um, both keeps the status quo in place. We've done it, we do a number of things, including a lot of work inside of writers' rooms um, with um, working behind the scenes to um, navigate the storytelling. We do work on the outside with getting shows off the air. We led the campaign that forced Fox to cancel the TV show Cops. After 25 years, we just forced another network to cancel a show about a bounty hunter. Um, that, um, we, um, we have a big report coming out in two weeks um, with um, UCLA, where we've looked at the diversity of 238 writers' rooms, and then track that back to the content on air, looking at when racism is shown on TV, is it individual or structural? The pathology that surrounds black families on TV, which creates a makers and takers framework, and when criminal justice is shown on TV, or the justice system is shown on TV, is it individual, I mean, is it, infallible or are they showing um, challenges? And um, looked at um, 238 writers' rooms, then looked and then a qualitative study on the other side with Darnell Hunt, who's the head of sociology department and does the diversity report at UCLA, really looking at uh, the role that those, um, those TV shows play in people's perceptions. We have another report coming out in February with USC specifically on the role of crime procedures, looking at everything from um, who gets shown as a victim and how that incentivizes um, um, who, um, is, um, uh, who, who, who gets um, empathy and support with a lot of recognition to um, our friends at um, AFJ, ASJ and Durant, Dur Danielle Sarid and a lot of other folks that have done a lot of work at uplifting the role that um, uh, victims um, and victims' rights have played in where we're at in this country. And, um, and so a lot of that work in Hollywood has been really important and I think um, it is once again not just about the reports but about building power on the outside to force change and then going on the inside to help folks do a better job. The only thing I want to add, and this isn't necessarily about Hollywood, but, but about content. Um, I'm working with some folks in Los Angeles right now to build a program for young people um, and really treat them as the tastemakers that they are, right? Because especially young people of color, the same folks that were out on the streets in Ferguson, they create the culture, right? They create the taste. They determine what is popular and what is not, and they never receive dividends from it, right? Nike gets very rich off of the taste young people make, right? Uh, Twitter, Vine, they've all made a lot of money based off of what young people do, and those young people are still broke, and they still can't afford the things that they need to afford. So what we are trying to build is a space where they can um, work as creatives and also as business folks, right? So to collect the capital and the wealth from the things that they are creating. And then our challenge to them is how, how, do you, how are you investing this, both collectively and individually? And I share that preview to say that I believe that the future of this thing 
has to dismiss the paternalism with which we have continuously operated. We have always privileged folks, folks with good titles and good degrees, we have always set the agenda for other people and told them to fall in line. Instead of saying, it is your agenda to set because this is your community and therefore we are going to be behind you. Similarly, we are not going to fund these young people's dreams. We are going to set them up to fund their own dreams, right? That difference in empowerment versus paternalism is the place that we have to go and we're not going to figure this thing out until we do so so let me t get uh, a cut into our audience Q&A time but we have a few more minutes left um, let me take some questions from the audience and is somebody walking around with a mic perhaps and let's just make sure there are questions there you go I have uh, one question about mindset uh, first of all uh, my name is Art Knight I'm actually deputy chief uh, Minneapolis uh, Police Department and what I want to talk about is mindset uh, for the prison system. When you look at police officers, and again, I have 26 years experience, and I can tell you a lot of law enforcement, when you look at an individual coming out of prison, <coughs> you have that mindset, that implicit bias. We actually say, we're going to target that person because we know that individual right there is going to actually go back to prison. In fact, sometimes law enforcement have a viewpoint, they actually become smarter criminals in prison. And then when I talk with individuals, I say, why do we have private prisons? Why would we ever want to have private prisons for profit? And I think our prison system should really talk about rehabilitating people so they can be a part of society and then changing their mindset from law enforcement because people do deserve a second chance. So just talk about what your, your viewpoints are on private prisons. Let me do this and let's remember the panel is um, advocacy in the 21st century. So if you can talk a little bit about some of the advocacy strategies around private prisons, but go ahead, Craig. Yeah, just to keep consistent with what I said, if we're going to advocate for change, we got to focus on the values and what's at stake. And what's important about that question, I would say, what do you have prisons for in the first place? What do you have prisons for in the first place if the police officers even are going to say that they make people worse? Why would you send somebody to a hospital if their condition got worse? Why would you send your kid to school if they were made less smart? Challenge the whole system because the police officers, and this is the immoral part of what's going on. We're asking our police officers to be the modern tax collectors of our day. We're telling them that they have to stop and frisk so many people that they've got a quota. We're telling them that they get to seize people's stuff because that funds the new cars and the pension plans and the other things rather than saying, you're funded to do justice, and when we convict somebody and we put them through a process, it's supposed to be so you never see them again. They're part of the solution, not part of the problem. It's an indictment on the entire system. As far as private prisons go versus public system, I'm not trying to shirk my responsibilities as a panelist here. Um, I'm a cynic. I'm a conservative. I've run a state system that was heavily unionized. I see no difference in behavior between government employees and, and the shareholders of for-profit corporations, and I think both of them need an incredible amount of scrutiny and, and uh, change because it's almost identical, the, the behaviors and the motivational problems I see that lead to perverse incentives and, and moral hazards. Yeah, so I totally disagree on the incentive structure um, around privatizing um, public goods and putting a profit on the number of beds um, that need to be filled through these state contracts. At the same time, I will say that if we got rid of all the private prisons in this country, it would just be a drop in the bucket um, in terms of um, the num of, of where we're at in terms of mass incarceration. And so sometimes private prisons capture the imagination of like that we, if we get rid of them, then we've solved the problem. At the same time, the warped incentive structures, the level of human rights violations that then get covered up, the um, ways in which um, banks and businesses, and we've had a lot of experience trying to do divestment campaigns um, on private prisons, and the complicated way that they are, um, that the shareholders um, are protected through mutual funds and pension funds and the investments has made that type of campaign one of the hardest type of divestment campaigns. And we like to say that we not only run them, but we win those type of campaigns, forcing corporations to do things that they don't want to do. And it's just been an ongoing, very hard thing and something that we've actually had to backtrack on and take some time to really learn from the fracking 
folks and others um, because it is a really complicated campaign, but private prisons um, and the incentive, warped incentive structures um, that, that they create um, are something that we need to get rid of, but it doesn't mean that we've actually done the work of ending mass incarceration. And so very quickly to extend the conversation, because I think you're exactly right, we can't let public prisons off the hook. One is uh, a tactic of exposure. So unless you have a family member or know someone or you yourself have been in prison or in jail, a lot of folks do not understand the mechanics of all of this and how it works. So that is, I mean, there is literally a cartoon, I kid you not, that connects the dots between private prisons in Missouri and the rental car company that I was just talking about, right? Um, because folks are just not seeing what's happening behind the scenes. So that gives people the information to, for instance, instance, create economic pressure, which was a choice that the activists made. Um, but there's also a level of exposure that, you know, I remember as activists have been jailed, how much money we had to send people just for them to get phone cards to call out, right? I mean, it's these extravagant prices, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but these are the stories that don't get told. And so not only giving those humanizing elements and telling those stories, but also telling the stories that are happening every day that in, in our, our mind as folks on the outside feel extreme is critically important. Um, the second thing I will say though is that we have decided, especially in the movement space, to leave room for every option. So a lot of people want to stop the conversation at how do you reform prisons. We are perfectly willing to have a conversation about what happens if we can abolish prisons, right? If we're not willing to imagine that far, then if we're not willing to shoot for the moon and land amongst the stars, then we're not going to get anywhere. That's why we called Campaign Zero, Campaign Zero. We didn't call it Campaign Fewer, we called it Campaign Zero. People think that it's unbelievable, but if we do not push our ability to imagine, we're not going to get very far. Um, and so I think that, especially as an advocacy tool, as we, as we work in this space, we have to be willing to move all the way there and say, what would it look like to rehabilitate folks without using a prison? So we have one minute left. Uh, is there anyone with a burning question? Yes, there's one question over there. My name is Stephen Saloum. I'm a, I've done a nationwide state focused policy advocacy, criminal justice reform advocacy for 13, 14 years. And I guess the, in one minute, um, the concern is how do you change the state law? You know, because so much of, of what's driving prison policy is state-based, right? It's legislative, and it's gerrymandered. And so you can build your power, and you can seize the moment, build the power, pivot on the structural stuff, and it's all critically important. By the way, this panel has been phenomenal. You guys are doing incredible work. Um, but I'm still, um, and there's no easy answer, but I, I'm interested in the continuing work on doing that flip to get an entire state legislature. House to vote for it, Senate to vote for it, governor to approve it, given the gerrymandering and given the color of the population in most states and how that breaks out. Um, uh, yeah, no, that's yeah, a really important question. That's yeah. back to like traditional advocacy. So, Craig, do you I want know to start? We're, we're out of time here, sir, but excellent question. Um, here are the elements, in my view. You uh, start with the morals and the values, you uh, try to attract people from the right and the left, you try to gang up. And, and to get the most powerful people that already have the political capital uh, from those groups. So you try to expand it out to um, unusual uh, allies, like so the business community or the educational communities and others that say, hey, that's a great point, it affects us. You build a nexus of where this is important, uh, wider than, than just the lives or the jobs affected by it. And, and you build that coalition and, and you use your money to inform the culture, the, the, the voters. So you have a more durable base because in that you're serving the elected official it, because now uh, it's a safer vote for them because the people that donate to their campaigns that support them are, are, are surrounding them in saying this is the way to go and they're also using their money to inform their voters that this was a smart vote because then if things go wrong and they always will, it won't be perfect, uh, they know that, that uh, they've had a political infrastructure they've been surrounded by, and that's, to me, the best model. And so it's I, I agree with that 100%, and I would add that we also have to take people out, and that is the pivot. And if we don't actually have people lose their jobs electorally um, at the ballot box 
change won't happen because the status quo is always more powerful than making any type of change. Keeping what's in place is always more powerful. So we, the pivot, when I said respond, build, the pivot is um, how yeah. do we electoralize this to protect the people who are doing what's right and taking the hard votes and kick out the people who aren't. The only other things that I would add are a, to continue to make the economic argument. So I work full time in education um, and we have been able to get involved in this conversation because I tell folks all the time about how much cheaper it is to educate a child well than to incarcerate them when they're older, right? And that conversation gets me in a lot of rooms that other people are just not in that work in my field because they're unwilling to, they only want to have the moral conversation, which honestly is what I'm rooted in, but I recognize the efficacy of the economic conversation, so we can't let that one go. The other thing, and you brought it up in your question, is simultaneous to all of these direct strategies, we have to handle voter disenfranchisement and gerrymandering. Like the SCOTUS case that has come out of Wisconsin is one that we all need to be paying attention to. Because at the end of the day, we treat gerrymandering like it is just a given, right? Like our districts are gonna be gerrymandered and this is how it's gonna be. From school boards all the way up to statewide stuff, if we take that on at every single level, we can shift that moving forward and take back our power. Um, and even while that process is happening, electives will get so scared that the thing could shift it, that they're going to have to start to move their positions to ready themselves to appeal to a more diverse base, whether or not we win the case. I have so much to say about voter suppression, but I'm gonna hold back and I'm gonna hold back about, on, but look, I really appreciate that this was a very rigorous and, and, and robust panel. I had no doubt it would be. I wanna thank these amazing speakers who are doing just awesome work in communities around the country. Thank you.